you're live. Okay, hey, Stephen Key here. My partner in crime, Andrew Krause, is on vacation. I'm really happy for him. So I'm going to do the Q&A today on LinkedIn. So I'm really happy that everybody's here. I'm going to wait for everybody to come in to make sure you can hear me. And if you can hear me, give me the thumbs up to make sure we're live and everything's going okay. All right. So let's see if people are here. Do, 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 do. There's my chat. I don't see anybody yet. I don't see anybody yet. Please type in something so I know you can hear me because today I am going to, oh, there we go. Here we go. I, hi, I'm here. Okay, wonderful. Okay, you guys, you know what's really amazing? Today I want to talk about, in fact, someone said to me, Steve, when you go on these rants, I really like when you go on these rants, and I'm going to go on a rant today. I'm going to go on the rant of things you need to avoid, things you need to step over. Um, and James, I've got chat going on both sides. You can take it off the screen if, you have, if, you, if you're listening to me. Okay, thank you. I'm going to talk about things you need to watch out for. Warning, warning, things that just don't work. I want to talk about all the things you want to step over and avoid because there's a lot of um, pitfalls, obstacles. There's just things that are going to trip you up. So the first thing I want to talk about, and I want to thank everybody that's here because it looks like we got a pretty good crowd. Uh, looks like we have Peter, we have Peter there, Gina's there, all oh, kind of great. Martin, hey Martin, you're there, Bit right coach, Martin. Uh, looks like everybody's coming. Okay, great. Looks like John, John, I see you again. You're always showing up. I'm really glad that you're showing up. Uh, Nadia's there. Hey, you guys, let me know if you're there, please. Put something in the chat. Oh, I see there. Hey, Christopher, how you doing? Hey, Scott, you're back again, too. Okay. I want to talk about things that you need to kind of watch out for. I don't really go into too much details about this, but I think it's time for me to kind of talk about it. Um, the one thing I want you to be careful of is that there will be a time where you might want to work with a patent attorney or a patent agent that you want to file a non-provisional patent application or even a PPA and you're excited and you want to protect your ideas and you're going to call that person and you you're going to put a lot of faith in that person to help you protect your invention. I think it's wonderful. But realize there's a conflict. There's a conflict between that person, a patent agent or a patent attorney and you. There's a conflict. He's there to protect your invention regardless if it's marketable. He will protect anything. And that's really his job. His job is to do what you tell him to do. And he's not going to stop you. And he's definitely not going to tell you to do a couple things that might prevent you from working with him. Okay. So there's a conflict. And that conflict is something that I think you can overcome if you really understand it. So a patent attorney, patent agent, they're, they're going to listen to you and they're going to do exactly what you, you want them to do. And they're going to, they're going to talk about it in such a way that it's going to be very convincing that you have an idea. Maybe they'll tell you it's a great idea. <laughs> Maybe they'll tell you, congratulations, <laughs> there's nothing like it or whatever they're going to tell you because they want your business. All right because their goals are different than yours. Your goals is to come up with an idea that people want. Your goals is to commercialize your creativity. Your goals is to either license or vention your product ideas. Your goal is to be successful in this business, meaning driving revenue with your ideas. That has nothing to do with that patent attorney. That's not his goals. So. His goals do not align up with yours. His goals is, I got to keep the lights on. I need billable hours. I need to, I need you as a client. <laughs> okay, so 
all right, so maybe he does prior art search, maybe he doesn't, or maybe he doesn't look so hard, or or maybe he tells you, hey, we can get around this one patent, or or whatever it is. But his goal is not to tell you, should you even be doing this? That's not his goal. That's your goal to determine that. So I want you to realize they're going to tell you things, and because of who they are and what they represent and their law degree, it's going to sound very convincing. But you, as an inventor, product developer, an entrepreneur, you have to be very careful to really test the market a little bit with maybe a provisional patent application or maybe do these things to see if anybody truly wants it. And then maybe providing the right information to that patent attorney or patent agent so they can do a really good job for you from a business perspective. That means not only protecting your invention, but it means protecting the innovation. That means doing it in such a way that your claims line up with your business objectives. You're the one that has to be more in control of your destiny. Do not put it in the hands of anybody else. Okay, that's my first rant, you guys. I love these patent attorneys. They drive me out of, absolutely out of my mind sometimes because I see them trying to protect something that there is no way that idea is ever going to see the light of day. That idea will never go anywhere and they just don't care, but I care and you care. All right, there's my first rant. So let me answer a couple questions here and then I'll go to my second rant. Okay, okay, Joe, let's read yours. Hey, Steven, I have a great sell sheet and I don't have a video. The product is very simple to understand. Do I need a video if it's very simple to understand? Joe, no, you don't, okay, you guys, this is really a good question. Do I do a video? Do I do a sell sheet? Do I do both? Whatever, whatever you, whatever, you, whatever tools you decide to use, a, a sizzle reel, which is your video or a sell sheet, make sure, which depends on which ones, what is the best tool to help sell, license, communicate the benefits of your idea? And if you can do it on a sell sheet, Great, because some ideas are so simple, you see it, I get it, I don't need a video. Okay, great, then use your sell sheet. And sometimes the sell sheet is, is not enough. You want someone to actually see it and, and, and see someone using it and, or maybe see the problem in your solution. So you need a video. So pick which one that you think really communicates the best. If you can do both, even better. If you can do both, fantastic. But this is what I want to tell everybody. Whatever you choose to do, a sell sheet or the video, test it too a little bit with your friends or with a spouse or whoever. Test it a little bit and make sure it's communicating clearly and concisely the big benefit of your idea within seconds. That's what you need to do. Joe, that was a great question. So thank you very much. Um, let's see. Hey, Hector, I see you. You know, I want to talk a little bit of, um, Hector, I want to talk about a conversation we had yesterday. Um, because this is a, a, a situation that everybody, um, sooner or later, this is going to happen to you. You have a great idea and you send it to a company and they're kind of, they like it, they're talking to you and they have to go back and do some work. And that's really great news. They have to do some work. And that work is probably maybe working on pricing or, or maybe checking with someone to see, hey, can we even make it? Or, or is the benefit strong enough? Do our customers really want it? But it, the bottom line is they have to do some homework. So they're gonna go off and they're, they're gonna do their homework and then they're gonna come back and, and hopefully your project moves forward. But in the meantime, you're going crazy. You're out of your mind. What are they doing? Why are they taking so long? I talked to them last week. Now it's been two weeks, three weeks, and they haven't said anything to me. It's gone silent. Are they stealing my idea? <laughs> what? All this stuff is racing through your head and you're thinking, what do I do? When do I reach back out to them? What do I say? I'm worried. That's what you're basically saying, I'm worried. And I'm here to tell you that be patient. Realize they're really working on your behalf and realize that they have to do some work. And you want them to do this work because you want them to come back with that, heck yes, we're going forward. We did our pricing, we did our marketing, you know, testing, whatever it is, to come back and go, we're ready to go. You want them to do that, that's a great investment. So be patient. Now, here's the, 
here's the best advice I have. If it goes longer than a month, that's, a, that's not a great sign. Something's happening and you don't know what it is. So I would do this. And someone gave me this advice. I don't know who told me this, but it's very powerful. I wish I, I, wish I would remember who told me this because this really works. When you reach out to that person, use the I word, I. I'm concerned. Is everything okay? I haven't heard from you in a while and I'm a little worried. Is there anything I can do? I am concerned that maybe there's a problem. Are you okay? Use the I word. You're, you've changed it from all about being by me, 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 me. What are you doing for me? You've changed that conversation that you, you care about him as a person. And maybe there is a problem. Maybe he, you know, went on vacation or maybe he got COVID or who knows what. But use that word. That will help you. So, guys, be patient. Reach out when you need to. Be extremely helpful. Don't be the pest. It's going to take longer than you think. Um, does InventRight, Nadia, great question. Like, does InventRight require an NDA before taking clients? Well, yes, we, we, we want you to feel comfortable, you know, and, and so, yes, we have you sign an NDA. It could be yours, it could be ours, just so you know, we're not disclosing your invention, of course. And we want you to, to realize that because of that NDA, it really helps you from a disclosure issue as well. So yes, we do do that. We require it. I think it's a smart move. And if you don't want one, that's okay too. But I think it's uh, it's just a policy that we've done over and over and over again. Okay. Uh, hey, John, thank you for coming back. Um, feedback from one company said, I would need a large distributorship for my closet organizer. Should I be reaching out to larger companies? Um, okay. I'm not quite sure I understand that question, John. So maybe you could put something in there to clarify a little bit. But let's talk about distributors for just a minute. This is one thing I've learned about distributors. Um, distributors don't help you sell. They distribute products. And yes, there are some distributors that you really want them to distribute your product to all these places because they, they've got the network, they've got it down. But distributors will tell you, you need to create demand. You need to create demand that people want your product, asking for your product, and then they will pick it up and distribute it. Makes perfect sense. Distributors don't sell, they distribute products. You have to create the demand. So John, send me in another question there because I don't think I answered it, but I wanted to talk a little bit about distributors. Um, okay, here we go. Here's one. Um, hi, Stephen. What what do I do? What what do I do? Persist or should I even connect to creative directors? They told me. Okay, he's talking about portals. You know, this 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 gentleman has asked me this question on a YouTube channel about portals. Okay. I'm going to go on my rant here. Here's my second rant all right, about portals and how to build relationships with companies. Um, and hopefully I can answer this question too. Okay, portals, right? You know, that little button when you go to a company's website and it says, submit your idea here. It's so tempting to submit your idea through the portal, right? I mean, there it is, it's in front of you. I've got a kitchen gadget, they're a kitchen company, and there's a button that says submit your idea here. Bingo! I'm going to submit my idea to them. I, I'm happy about it. I, I, I would I read their, their submission policy and I'm still excited about it. And then I send it over there and then nothing happens. It goes quiet. And you're wondering, did they get it? What's going on there? And then you're lucky if someone comes back and goes, we got it. We're not interested. Yes or no. Okay. Portals don't work. I love, I would love to think that portals would work. I would love to tell you your best chances of licensing ideas would be going through portals, <laughs> but, but they just don't really work very well. Um, and I don't know the reason why, 
Um, I think there might be a couple of reasons why. Well, maybe the first reason why is they're getting a lot of submissions and they want to make sure they document them correctly by coming in through the portal. But they know that most of those ideas that come in from everybody out there, the chances of them finding that one great idea, it's pretty slim because those portals are really being used by people that are very new at this. And so they know that you're new at this and they know that you're reaching for the button. And so they, they, this whole volume of all these submissions come into these portals, but they also know that they don't license much from portals. And, I'll, and the thing that I learned when I wrote this book called Become a Professional Inventor, where I interviewed 30 companies and they all told, told me flat out, no, we don't license things through portals because usually the people that are submitting through the portals are at the very beginning of the journey, right? And they know that. So portals really don't work. Um, the portals that are third party portals, there's a couple companies out there that, hey, we work with all these companies and all these companies are looking for ideas. And here they all are. We work with this company, this company, this company. And here they all are, and you can submit to them. Those don't work either. Um, I've talked to some of the companies that have used those systems for like 10 years. Um, and I've asked them, does it work? And they say, well, no. I go, why, why do you use them? And they say, well, it makes it easy for us to say no. What? Yes, it makes it easy for us to look at it and say no. And then what that company does, that these third party portal people, then, then they start to solicit you to sell you stuff because when they provide that portal to that company looking for ideas, they have an agreement. I'm gonna give you this software to review it and in exchange, when you get a note, I get to solicit that person. Wow, it's a bait and switch. Holy smokes. Now, and some of those third parties might even charge you money now. Hey, you've, you've got so many submissions come through here. If the portals worked, especially the third party portals, you would see success. In fact, they would list their social proof that the portals work. They would say, we license these ideas to this company, this company, you would see a list. In fact, they would be bragging about it. They'd be yelling from the, the treetops, hey, this, this works, but do you see any success? Always look for the social proof, always look for the success. If they cannot show you the success, then I would avoid that. I think it's a waste of time. Yes, it's attempting to use the portals. Yes, it is. Do they work? No, they don't. Okay, I went on rant. So how do you get around portals? That's the question this young man's asking me now. And he's asked this question on my YouTube channel too. Steve, um, I want to submit to toys companies, but they want me to go through the portal. But you're telling me don't go through the portal. <laughs> Uh, okay, what I'm telling you is this, maybe, um, and the companies that are, the big companies that are doing the portals too, you have to realize those are some of the big guys and they get a lot of submissions too. So maybe you don't do the biggest guy first, you maybe you go down to the, it's kind of the smaller companies. And what, what I mean by the smaller companies, they still have great distribution, they're still selling a lot of product but they're not like the monster companies that are getting thousands and thousands and thousands of ideas. They, they are, are the, the mid-sized companies are a little bit more um, user-friendly. They want to build a relationship. Those are the guys that you can start to, you know, build your career. Those are the guys you can start to work with and get better at this, right? And so I would say, look, you know, I would find the companies that don't do the portals and try to build a relationship with someone in customer or someone in inventor's relations. And here's the trick, you guys. You want to eventually get to someone and their title is inventor relations. Those are the guys you want to get to. Those are the guys that are going to tell you their wish list. Those are the guys that are really going to help you be successful, not a portal. You guys, you have to realize this is too. A lot of companies um, don't really have an inventor relations department. So they use these third-party portals to kind of do the filtering system. That doesn't work either. So 
you really have to find the right company that wants to work with you. And you can do it through LinkedIn. That's a great way to build it. Um, you could go to trade shows. You could do other ways um, to, to make a relationship with these inventors relations. But getting back to your question, if you have to go through a portal, then go through it. There it is. But just recognize that doesn't really work. So there you go, you guys. You got to find a way around it. Okay. That's my second rant for today. All right. Let's see. I love this here. Here's a LinkedIn user. Why don't you have your name? It's kind of weird when they do that. I love InventRight's approach to test viability of a product before trying to launch it into the market because that's an expensive endeavor. Okay, no one's going to pay for it. Okay, you guys, let me tell you what's really interesting. I saw this post last night from this person that's a professional product developer. He went to school, he's very trained, and he's got a company. And that company produces uh, prototypes, right? And they're very expensive prototypes, by the way. And, and, uh, but that's what he does. He's been trained. He probably does a wonderful job. And, and he, he posted this thing that um, um, licensing doesn't work. <laughs> what? That um, he knows for a fact that licensing isn't working. He's going to tell me why. And so he's from the UK. He did this little video. It's really kind of nice. And, but some of the things that he pointed out were, were, were kind of correct in some ways, but he's never seen anything ever licensed. Well, okay. He's not looking, number one. Number two, he doesn't know enough about licensing. Number three, he doesn't want licensing because he wants to build prototypes for you guys. <laughs> okay, so, um, so what I realized that the method that this person and other people is the traditional method that, and the reason why he doesn't see a lot of licensing because he's involved in the traditional thing. And the traditional thing is, hey, let's build a prototype. Let's spend $10,000 <laughs> and maybe let's start a company. And, and maybe, 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 maybe at the very end when we've spent tens and tens of thousands of dollars, and I've seen this all the time, you guys. In fact, I've seen people reach out to me where they've spent $100,000. And, and now they're reaching out to the industry to see if anybody wants it. You guys, can you imagine that? Someone spending that much money and then trying to, they got a commercial, they got a prototype, they, they've got the packaging, they got the logo, they filed the patents, they did all this work. And then now they're reaching out to the industry to see, anybody, to see if anybody wants it. Well, that method that this, this person was talking about on this post, that method that he's involved in does not work. If it works, it, it works very poorly. It, it's just not, it's a bad investment to do all this work. What I want you guys to do is realize you can test ideas. And he calls them testing ideas with pretty pictures. I love you said that, pretty pictures. Okay. All right. <laughs> I kind of laugh about that. And I, I hear that all the time. Steve, you can't license anything with a pretty picture. Well, you can test an idea with a pretty picture. You can test the benefit of your product with a pretty picture. In fact, I can test an idea with a one-line benefit statement, right? Because I'm selling benefits. So I'm all about testing ideas and finding something that someone says, I want this. And that want, that desire, that market demand is so important, so big at times, it doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter if you have patents or prototypes or whatever it is. If you can learn to test ideas quickly, to find that one that works, then you can stay in the game of inventing longer. If you're spending all those big dollars, you're not going to be in the game for very long at all. So anyway, there's another kind of semi rant. You guys, I love these rants. That's my semi rant. Oh, wow, that's crazy. Can I sell my idea instead of licensing? Can I? Here's another one, you guys. Can I sell my idea instead of licensing? All right, here's another thing, you guys. No, people don't buy ideas. They don't buy patents. Why is that, Steve? Well, the smart companies know I'm going to rent it from you. I don't need to buy your house. I could rent it from you. Because if I rent it from you, I can test it without spending all that money and risking all that money buying the house. I can just rent it. So. It, 
that's a smart move. I'm going to rent it. I don't need to buy it. I'm going to rent it from you and pay you a royalty on each and every one they sell. So no, no one's going to buy your patent. No one's going to buy your idea. They're going to rent it. Now later, they might buy it. Yes, that's true. They might buy it later. Right, but at the very beginning, it's too much risk. It's called top loading the deal. They're not gonna do that. Um, here's another one. Ooh. Can we have the top three easiest industries to license to? Yeah, I'll give you, I'll tell you the easiest ones. Um, I would say one of the easiest ones today is probably the pet industry. Why? Well, the pet industry has been growing leaps and bounds every year, especially since COVID. Jeez, who doesn't have a dog, right? And in the pet industry, it's not a really big industry. And it's kind of an open innovation industry. And they're just lovely people in that industry. That's a great industry. And we, we see a lot of our members licensing ideas in the pet industry all the time. Okay. In fact, this one, one of our members, I actually like this too. Here's a product that got licensed um, recently in the pet industry. In fact, I just saw this at uh, Petco just yesterday when I was there looking for a jacket for my dog. And um, Aaron that licensed this, uh, it's really cool. This is a, a treat, kind of a reward toy. You put treats in here in different places, and as the dog rolls it around, treats fall out. Now, Aaron, if you're watching this, I'm going to tell him a secret. You don't even have a dog. So... He loves dogs. I think his friends have dogs. But here's a guy licensing a bunch of stuff in the in the pet industry. He doesn't even have a dog. All right, that's a great industry, a fun industry. And hopefully, I didn't tell a secret out of school. Okay, um, can I show you a brand new product that just got licensed? Does everybody see that? This just got licensed, and um, Jennifer's one of our members at InventRight. Um, I did a YouTube video with Jennifer, I think it posted this week, and she's licensed three ideas or four ideas in the last year. Guys, four ideas in the last year? And she talks about how she did it. And this one particular product that she shows this is building a fountain, a water fountain for kids. How cool is that? That's one of those really cool, you know, kind of a crafty thing, but you build it, um, and it works, it's function. It's a cool thing to build with your kids and it actually works. Um, she saw a need. She came up with this rough prototype, it's in the video. She called one company and she found the right company. And that's the one thing that most inventors miss. They're not hitting the target with the right company, with the right product. And I would say that most of the ideas that do fail as us inventors are not hitting the right companies. We don't know who the right companies are. We think they do, but we really don't. So we're sending out to companies that we're just missing, 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 missing. But Jennifer is so good at this um, that she knows how to target and hit those companies correctly. And um, so I asked her, I go, what? One company, because Steve, one company took it and it was gone. It was just the right fit. She knew exactly what company to hit that company took it and now it's on the market and it's called Make It Real. It's really kind of cool. Bring your creativity to life. I really like it. Good job, Jennifer. Good job, Jennifer. All right. Uh, let's say, let's see. Let me look at a couple more here. Uh, okay, John, I'm going to go back to you real quick. It says, how do you test a product idea with the USPTO? can use your own art against you as prior art. Yes, John, they can. Okay. All right, you guys, <laughs> this is great. Thank you for that question. Um, John's saying this, I need to test the market, but I don't want my testing to come back and let the USPTO patent examiner use my testing to see if anybody wants it as prior art to stop me from getting my patent. John, very simple. This process works. You file a provisional patent application and you file it the correct way where it really has value. And I talk a lot about that. And then you have a year of patent pending status. A one year. Now, 
for me, one year is eternity. And but for a lot of people that are very busy and don't really know the process, they get caught that the, the, the one year starts to come up and they haven't done enough work. They're like, what do I do now? What do we do now? Do I file a non-provisional? I haven't done the work. I don't know if anybody wants it. And I don't know what to do. So John, this is what you do. It's really simple. And we teach us that at InventRight. You're going to get your marketing material right, your list of companies right. You're going to get everything. You're going to get the filing, your PPA, ready to file your PPA. You're going to get everything right, the list of companies. You can do all this work. You really have done everything. And then you're going to, before you send it to anybody for a test to see if they want it, you file the PPA. Now you have a year. And if you cannot get it done within a year, you need more help because you should be able to test that within 30 days, way before a year is over, 30 days, right? At InventRight, when you have a coach there, all the coaches know, I want them to get those members, our students in the game within 90 days. That's a long time, that's a long time, 90 days in the game, talking to companies, getting feedback, all that kind of stuff. If we cannot get you in the game in 90 days, Something's going wrong. So, John, you got to speed it up. You're taking too long. All right. Let's see. Da, da, da. Oh, the second industry. I talk about, thank you for getting me back on track. The pet industry. The second, I would say, would be the kitchen industry as being a very, very popular industry to license ideas to. Why is that? Well, that industry has been working with, with us. And, and designs firms and product developers for a long time. They're very comfortable working with us. And, and that's a big industry. You know, if you go to the Chicago show that just happened, there's thousands of companies looking for ideas. So they're very comfortable with working with us. It's very common, they understand that they're an open innovation industry. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. So that's a very inventor friendly industry. The third, inventor-friendly industry, I would say would be the toy industry. The toy industry has been licensing ideas for probably 80 years. It's probably the most open innovation industry there is. Now realize, sometimes it's an old boy network there. They, you know, sometimes you gotta break down the doors and find, build the relationships and maybe not use the portals and things like that, but that's a very inventor-friendly industry. So those three. The hardware, I would put them in the same camp. The issue with the hardware, the hardware industry is that some of the bigger companies have bought all everybody else. So there's not as many as I wish there were. The big guys have kind of bought the little guys. The big guys really kind of want you to have a prototype. I understand they want proof of concept. Of course, it's a tool. They want proof of concept. And because it's a tool, they, they might have to spend a little bit more money on, on the manufacturing. So they would like to have some type of per, um, intellectual property. I'm gonna talk about that next too. So that is the requirements a little bit higher in that industry. Are they inventor friendly? Most of them are. So that's a great industry. The DRTV, come on you guys, DRTV, as seen on TV, that industry alone, all they bank on is us. The DRTV, as seen on TV industry, don't really have in-house designers. They count on us to submit them ideas. So that one is completely open. Is that an easy industry to license to? Well, yes and no. They don't need a lot of hits. Um, that's an industry that if they do take it, they're gonna sell millions of them. So it's not as big, there's not as many um, because they're not taking that many products to market. It's not like the kitchen industry where they're taking thousands to market. DRTV is a little smaller. They have a certain requirement. So it gets a little bit more, it gets a little smaller. But yes, that's that's pretty, pretty friendly. Um, the novelty gift industry, that was one of my favorite. That was the one I got my start in. That industry loves ideas because they need new ideas for every season. And there's a lot of holidays, okay? So that's another inventor-friendly um, industry. And there's many more, you guys, than that too, but that's just a few. So thank you for keeping me on track with that question. Um, 
who is this invent right oh here's a list yeah there's a list you guys and it, you know we if you want a list of companies that are looking for ideas we have a list if you go to our free resources on invent right free resources on invent right i think there's a list of 500 companies if you become a member at invent right we have a list of over 3000 and of course we bring on companies in fact, today there's a company coming on that's going to tell our members what are we looking for, what's required. I'm going to give you my hit list. And when companies give you your hit list, it's much easier to come up with ideas to hit that target. And also, we have a, a part of our program where we'll actually find those companies for you too. We do that too. All right. Okay. Um, Ivy guy, I see Ivy Stephen. A, a breath of fresh air. I love every video. I know. Guys, you guys, thank you for saying that. I love this industry. Um, I've said this before, and I'll say it again real quick. Uh, what do I do? Well, I help you license ideas. Um, how do I do it? Well, I do it with great coaching. I do it with great uh, roadmap. I do it with great information, like videos and articles and all that stuff. That's, that's, that's how I do it. Why do I do it? Well, I'm you. <laughs> I'm an inventor. I had obstacles ahead of me. I had people told me I couldn't do it. People told me I was crazy. People told me I was a loser. People told me all these type of things that the, maybe people are telling you too. And I found a way of doing it and it worked. And, and if I can help you, it'd be an honor to help you do it too, because I'll tell you, it changed my life. And it changed my life in such a way I'll, I'll, I can never get back enough. So I know what it's like to struggle. I know what it's like to get rejected. I know what it's like not to know for sure. I know what it's like. And, and because of that, I'm here to help you. Very simple. Okay. All right. What else do we have here? Uh, let's see. I've got, I want to talk about, um, I want to go on another rant here. <laughs> One more time. You guys, can I go on another rant? Okay. There's going to be a lot of situations out here that people are going to promise you the world. And you're going to be very tempting to take it because it sounds too good to be true. And it is too good to be true. There's going to be part of this industry that's going to tell you, hey, we'll do this. We'll do this. We'll do this. We'll do this. We'll do everything. And you can sit back. Don't worry. We'll take care of it. Well, <laughs> that doesn't work and it doesn't work in fact it's so terrible that it doesn't work that those type of companies get sued all the time and those type of companies have complaints at the USPTO those type of companies um, are not they really don't have your best interest because they're not inventors um, they promise a lot to deliver very little they promise just enough not to get them in too much trouble Okay, and, and I'm, I'm here to tell you, they're gonna come up with different ways to make that very attractive. One thing, we'll do, we'll do everything for you. Here's another thing they're doing now that's really interesting. We love your product, let's partner. And, um, and we, we get to share in the royalties too. So we're gonna partner together, share in the royalties, and all you have to do is send us $4,000. <laughs> and then, then that $4,000 grows to 8,000 because we need this and that 8,000 grows to this because we need this. You guys, that's a bait and switch. Um, it's clever. It's, and they're very good at this. In fact, each, every year they come up with something brand new to get us people that aren't informed to join whatever they're doing. But we end up spending a lot of money and nothing happens. So I'm, I'm here to tell you the hard, harsh truth here you're going to have to work your rear end off. You're going to have to have good information. You're going to have to have a community. You're going to have to have someone to support you through the roller coaster ride, emotional roller coaster ride, financial roller coaster ride. You need someone there for you to help you so you can stay in the game longer, right? Because if you stay in the game longer, your ideas just get better. And I know a lot of you are listening that you probably don't trust yourself a little bit. And I think that was really interesting when I heard that. What do you mean you don't trust yourself? Well, maybe you've done something before and it didn't work. Or, or maybe you realize that you don't have the discipline. 
or maybe you've done something that you failed. And so you don't really trust yourself. Well, I think a lot of us have <coughs> started things we didn't finish. I think a lot of us have. Hell, everybody. So if you don't trust yourself, make sure you have a partner, a coach, a mentor, professor, teacher, I don't care what it is. Find someone that can keep you accountable. Find someone that's going to keep you on track. Find someone that's been through it, ups and downs, and find someone that knows the end game, and find someone that's going to make sure you show up. There it is, you guys, to make sure you show up and get the work done. And that's going to help you become closer to what you're trying to do. Um, let's see. Okay, this is a great one. James, great question here. James, what, what do I do if I have a patent? Good for you. It has a patent in 2018. Um, and it's his, his idea is not on the market yet, but a company comes out almost like with the exact product this year. Wait, okay, James, let me see if I understand this. You file for a patent back in 2018, and maybe you have the patent, or maybe it's patent pending, whatever it is, but you've, you've done that, you're the first inventor, you think you are, and somehow someone else comes up with the same idea. What do you do? Is that the question you're asking me? What, what do you do? Well, first of all, you have to realize that when you patent an idea, there's a very good chance you've only patented the, the invention. And this is, people aren't telling, telling you this either. Because you're patenting the invention, someone probably can get around you by patenting a different, different aspect of it or different variation. It's called a workaround. They've worked around your patent. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. So that workaround is very common. You know, engineers are trained to work around patents. Patent attorneys have been trained to work around patents. Well, there's patents on, on uh, there's patents on the phone, right? Well, there's patents on the phone. How many phones are there out there? <laughs> okay, so people found around those patents. There's patents on cars or vacuum cleaners, everything else, and, but there's different variations of cars and vacuum cleaners and phones, everything else. So those are workarounds. So what do you do about the workarounds? Why isn't anybody explaining the workarounds? Well, they're not explaining that to you because that's not their job. They're not looking at the business from a business perspective. And that was the first rant I went on of how there's a conflict with patent attorneys and inventors. You have to realize that when you file a provisional patent application to consider what are the workarounds and variations and you need to steal it from yourself. So. So when something happens, James, that you see another idea that comes out that's similar to yours, you can look at it and see if they have stepped on your claims. Maybe they have, maybe they didn't. Okay, so that workaround is really interesting. The reason why I understand workarounds so much is that I have a wall of patents here. That wall of patents are workaround patents. Now, let me explain that. I had a, 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 a product innovation, it's right over here. You can see it here. Here's a, it's a label, you turn it, there's a window, you spin it, it gives you different information. Now, that technology had a big, a lot of labels out there. Okay, so I filed patents on one technology and I soon, I soon learned there's all these different label manufacturing techniques. So I started filing these workaround patents. So if someone's trying to get around me, there was another patent in, in front of them, another patent in front of them, another patent in front of them, another patent in front of them. And so when I landed in court against a little company, and that little company, I'm trying to find the product here. Yeah, the, the, in, the little company um, was, everybody see that? 
the little company was Lego. <laughs> um, yeah, and they um, they have a, a rotating label. See that right there? Um, so, long story short, we're selling hundreds of millions of labels. And I'm filing patents on all label techniques. I'm stealing it from myself, workarounds and variations, because I know there's some really smart people out there are going to try to work around my invention. So I have to protect the innovation. So I start filing those type of patents. And, and sure enough, I end up in federal court against Lego. And they came, it's, they're having a very difficult time getting around my workaround patent. <laughs> okay. And we settled two weeks before it went to trial. So I really understand workarounds and variations. That's kind of my specialty. I really get it. But who's teaching you that? Is your patent attorney teaching you that? I don't think so. So, and now all those patents on that wall, I didn't pay for those. I licensed it to a company and they paid for them. Right. So I'm all about the business of commercializing your creativity. And there's so many different ways of doing this, you guys. And I've done it for... I've done it for many, many years. I love this, but there's pitfalls and there's things you need to watch out for. And, and so when someone says to me, Steve, I have a sell sheet. I have a PPA. I don't need your help. I'm further along. I want to say you haven't even started. In fact, you, you've done two things that are great things. And now you're kind of in the game. What you just showed to me, you have passion. You're interested, but you have just started because there's, there's a lot to this. Even though it's simple, even though it's really simple, there's a lot to this whole thing of product licensing. Okay, I wanna talk about getting back to this one guy to, that was on some post on LinkedIn about how licensing doesn't work. But I have to say one thing about product licensing. It's been around for 200 years, it's not new. 200 years, it's not new. Um, some industries, all they do is count on product licensing. Hasbro, 60% of Hasbro's products were licensed from people like us. DRTV, all they do is take ideas from inventors. That whole industry counts on us. From the kitchen industry to the pet industry, research universities, Stanford, MIT, Columbia, all those, all those brilliant universities have a licensing department. That's how important that is. The military comes up with great innovation for the military, and then they license some of those applications to the commercial use. That's billions of dollars the military does. The Gatorade, you know, everybody knows what Gatorade is. That has produced billions in royalties and licensing. You guys, licensing's been around forever, but you have to know how to na navigate it navigate it correctly for all different industries. Anyway, I, I just had to tell everybody, look, this is not new stuff I'm talking about here. This has been around for a long, long time, you guys. And that's why I really like this whole world of product licensing. But for most people, it's brand new. I've never heard about it. They're not teaching it. Yeah, they're not teaching it. They want you to start a business, spend money, do all this stuff. And at the end of the day, everybody's made money but you. And I, and I think that's wrong. Okay. Um, wow, that's a depressing situation. <laughs> you guys, let me say something else too. Um, identical description from my brochure and almost exact design. Shame on them. Shame on them. Okay. <coughs> if you have a good idea, you'll get copied. Okay. You will be knocked off. Let's do all the words. You'll be knocked off, copied, infringed upon. They stole it. Yeah, they'll do all those things. And I say congratulations. There you go. I said it. Because they only steal good ideas. Wow, Steve, you're kidding me. Yeah, they only steal good ideas. All right. So how do I navigate that then? Right? How do, I, how do I play the game of product development being an inventor? How do I do it so I can participate and not just worry that people are going to steal my idea? Just realize right now, they're going to steal your idea. So how do you, how do we, how do you play different? Right? And I'm here to tell you, you can. 
and you can win at this, but you have to play a different game. You have to realize that because of online selling and Amazon and and Alibaba and crowd kick you know crowdfunding or, or Kickstart, um, what is it? Kickstart camp not Kickstart campaigns, um, crowdfunding campaigns or Shark Tank. You guys, everybody's looking for that hit idea, and the competition is going to come in. They're going to come in so fast. If you're on Shark Tank. You show a product three weeks later, it's selling on Amazon. I can guarantee it. All right, so, so how do you navigate that worry? I'm here to tell you, don't worry about it. Be prepared for it. Don't be naive. Don't, don't blame anybody else. Don't go, well, I'm not going to do it because it's not fair. Well, the world isn't fair. What I want you to do is realize, okay, all right, I'm in the game. I got to play the big game with everybody. How do I do it? Well, you're going to do it by maybe licensing to a big company. You're going to do it by filing provisional patent applications that have workarounds and variations. You're going to do it by social media, by being an original. You're going to do it by maybe meeting retailers. You're going to do it in such a way that that big apple pie that you want to eat all by yourself after all the work, you're going, to get, you're going to get three quarters of that apple pie. You might not get all of the apple pie, but you're going to get the lion's share of that apple pie. And you should be happy that you got it. All right, so I'm, I'm not really worried about competition. I'm not really worried about PPAs or patents. I'm not really worried about any of this stuff. What I want you guys to realize, you can play the biggest game in the world, and you can play it anywhere in the world now. And you can work with the biggest companies in the world, but you have to be smart and you have to start thinking a little differently, right? People are worried about, hey, you know, I have to, sue, um, do I have to sue a company be in federal court? No, you guys, the fight is not in court anymore. The fight is on, it's, it's a court of public opinion. And guess what? The power just shifted to us. You have more power than you'll ever know. You have more, you're faster, you can do things quicker, you can use all the tools these companies can't do. And the one thing they can't do is take away your brand. They might steal your idea, they can't steal your brand. So you need to be prepared and use the right tools. And some of those tools aren't even patents, right? Some of those tools are just copyrights or trademarks or design patents. Those are the tools to stop everybody online, not patents. So you've got to shift your thinking a little bit and go, all right, I'm in the game. i got to play a big game. I, I need to be prepared. So it's not just about having a sell sheet. It's not just about having a PPA. It's about being prepared for the game you're playing because you're playing a big game, and it's an exciting game. It's a remarkable game. Let me tell you what's so great about this. When you play this game and you see your product on the store shelf or people using it, it is amazing. Right, it's amazing that you, this idea was in your head. Next thing you know, people are using it. It's amazing to, to get that first royalty check. It's amazing to see it on TV. All those things are incredible. So don't let fear stop you. Get good information. Step over the people that are trying to keep you, you know, from doing the things you want to do. Find the time to work on it. Have a good roadmap. Do all the things that get you in the game to be a professional. If you want to be an amateur. If you want this to be a hobby, then you pretty much just, you know, don't educate yourself and, and worry too, you know, most people worry about things that don't even matter today. People are worrying about things, the questions you're asking today, and I, I wanna thank you for asking these wonderful questions. There's 50 questions you haven't even asked, you don't even know to ask yet. Yeah, I can answer all your questions. But there's probably 50 other questions you don't even know to ask today. Right. Okay. So anyway, let me see. Let me see if I have a couple more here because I'm coming up on the hour and I'm having a good time. You guys, let me know if you like this. Give me a thumbs up. Put in there anything else you'd like for me to talk about. I want to know about that too. Um, I love this. I'm new to this. I, 
I have much to learn. Yeah, yeah, good for you. Yeah, this is incredible. Uh, or invent right and invent tribe, the same company. No, we are not the same company. You guys, when I first started out, Andrew Krauss and I said, why don't we do invent right? Because we think people are inventing wrong. <laughs> I said, okay, I don't care about the name. In fact, I didn't trademark Invent Right's name. I think I trademarked after 20 years, I trademarked it because I didn't care about the name. Because I thought people would find us because we have good information. I didn't really care about it. But there are other companies now that are very close to our name. So there might be a little confusion in the marketplace, okay? And one of them would be Invent Help. No, we're not Invent Help. We're Invent Right. Invent Tribe. No, we're not Invent Tribe. We're Invent Right. Okay, so if I had to do it over again, I'd probably come up with a different name. There you go. Okay, what else do I have here? That, I love that. That was great. Thank you for asking that question. I think it's really, really funny. Uh, okay, I see anything. Uh, let's see. I know I can't get to everybody. Okay, Stephen, I have a big idea. I have described the benefits of the product to someone who has a tremendous relationship in the senior care and says the idea is a game changer. Ooh, I like that. I have a prototype. Good, good. Manufacturing. Okay, uh, how should I communicate this site to a big player in a smaller micro category? This is the voice of the great and powerful Oz. You have about five minutes left. <laughs> no, James, I think I'm going all day. In fact, I think I'm enjoying this so much. I'm not ever leaving the, the Q&A on LinkedIn. That's what I think today. And you're going to have to sit there and listen to me ramble on forever and ever. Because you've only been listening to me for over 20-something years now. And I think a couple more hours would probably serve you well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I have too many gray hairs as it is. I know. Okay, Brian. Brian, you know, every industry is different. Um, every situation is different. Every company is different. So some of these questions that people ask, you know, it's really hard to have the right question for every situation. I, I do know this. It's important to look at the industry, who the players are, where are the weaknesses, where are the strengths, what do they do, do background checks to see if they've got any complaints or lawsuits, really knowing their customer, really know what their customers' needs and wants are, and, and maybe having manufacturing knowledge, and maybe having the big benefit that everybody's clear. But at the end of the day, it's compiling all this information together in such a way that when you communicate with a company, you, you know enough to sound like they want to work with you. Yeah, here's the last thing I'm going to say, guys. Companies are interviewing you probably more than your idea. Now, I used to think if the idea was big enough, it would overcome everything. That I could be naive and maybe not have all the questions and maybe not have all the answers. But if my idea was big enough, it would take care of itself. And I thought that for years and years and years. And what I realized, that's not true at all. They see a lot of ideas, and they're going to pick the ideas that they can easily implement, that's going to have a large demand, large profit margin. They're going to pick that idea that that inventor they're working with understands their business, that understands how to work with them, that's reasonable, that's an asset, all those things, because we are a liability to these companies. And I was like, what do you mean we're a liability to these companies? Well. If we're not knowledgeable, they have to train us, teach us, hold our hand. No, they don't want to do that. And the last thing they want to do is some champion of some company that sees your idea and loves it, is afraid to bring you in in front of their boss or other people because you're not, you don't know the process. And because of that, they're going to keep you out because you're just too risky for them because, because as inventors, sometimes we think it's all about us. It's me, 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 me. It's my product, my product, my product, my product. You're going to sell billions. It's my product. And they're thinking, no, 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 no. It's all about us. Right? You're licensing to us. It's about us. Not about you. It's about us. 
So you've got to kind of look at it very different, differently to, to work with these companies so they bring you in and they trust you. Okay, last question, James. I'm, hey, time's out. Yeah, you're at the um, top hour. Okay, you guys, I want to thank you for listening to me rant. I know Andrew is someplace enjoying himself, and so am I today. So I want to thank everybody for listening. If you like this, give me a thumbs up. I will probably see you next week with my partner in crime, Andrew Krauss. And educate yourself. Have a good time. Watch out for people promising too, too much. Avoid those portals like the plague. And uh, come over to Invent Right TV. Um, we're posting three videos almost each and every week. I think we're close to a thousand videos just for you guys. So anyway, this is Stephen Key. Thanks a lot. Thank you, James. See you guys next week.